Okay, back to lockdown cosmology, right? So <laughs> let's uh, let's take a slightly different tack this week, right? We, we've spoken about many of the great successes in cosmology. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that one of the big discoveries made in the 1960s and then um, further observations since then of this thing called the cosmic microwave background, this leftover radiation from the Big Bang. This is, this is heralded as uh, one of the highlights of cosmology in the last century. But I, I've seen some alternative views on where this radiation from the cosmic microwave background might be coming from. And somebody's suggesting that we just might be seeing reflected oceans. Do you want to tell us what the, the situation is? Yeah. So first of all, we've done some videos on the cosmic microwave background before. So you're probably clicking in, you can click in some direction for that. So the story goes like this. It's kind of a strange one. There's a, a person called, and I'll, I'll make sure I get the name right, Pierre-Marie Robital, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who was a, a radiographer, so a sort of expert in how radiation goes through human flesh, like a med medical person, who um, in 2002 decided that he had a whole bunch of ideas that uh, astronomers and physicists needed to know about, and so published a full-page ad in the New York Times explaining all his theories and and which must have cost him a lot and one of them was this idea that when astronomers cosmologists when they are seeing this thing called the cosmic microwave background uh, you you get some detector and you point it out at the night sky and it, it detects something his his theory was that this is actually coming from the oceans now here we are almost 20 years after that he has a youtube channel and a whole bunch of enthusiastic followers on YouTube and uh, none within professional cosmologists for reasons we will explain <laughs> okay. shortly. Okay, so so I've looked at some of this stuff, but let's just remind ourselves about how astronomers observe the cosmic microwave background, right? So the, the first observations which were, were made by accident were mm -hmm. using a... a a communications horn or whatever you want to call it. It was basically a, a device that could be used to talk to satellites, but it's located on the ground and it is a receiver. Re radiation comes in and it's sensitive to microwave part of the spectrum. So it saw the cosmic microwave background. But since that time, detectors have, have gone from being ground-based to being balloon-based to get you high up in the atmosphere to get away from the signal of the Earth to be in, in orbit around the Earth, and now some of the most up-to-date detectors, Planck, et cetera, they're located well away from the Earth in orbits like at the Lagrange points. So how, how is it supposed that what we are actually seeing is some sort of emission from the ocean? Well, this is the problem, is that actually if you start to look into the, the things he's published and into his videos, there's, there's never actually an explanation of this and in particular the the way he could show this particularly easily is to get a detector which is similar to the ones that we're using like a sort of small scale version of either that original horn or the kind of things that are put into space there's all sorts of detectors you can buy these days now it just needs to be able to detect radiation in that particular range which you know you can get those and then point it at the ocean and show that what comes out of that looks like what cosmologists think is the cosmic microwave background, but that that approach hasn't happened. Um, but you're quite right. I actually, for, for our, our book, uh, Cosmic Revolutionaries Handbook, I went through uh, basically all the measurements that I could find in the published scientific literature. There's um, 147 of them uh, in total and uh, where more than sometimes more than one uh, ex uh, experiment or observation is made by the same instrument. So there's dozens of different instruments. And if, if the light is coming from a, what's called a black body at a specific temperature, then it has a very specific spectrum. So um, what that means is, you know, how much light do you get at longer wavelengths versus you know mid-sized wavelengths versus shorter wavelengths. So our eyes are good at this. So 
for very for slightly longer wavelengths that's red light for slightly shorter wavelengths that's blue light and so our our eyes detect that mix of different wavelengths when we see color well you can expand that out to different bits of the spectrum and um we've known from um 120 years of observation and theory that when a uh, an object is at a specific temperature and all at the same temperature the light that it emits has a very specific very well defined very well measured and described uh, mix of the different wavelengths. So if we're down in the microwave region, uh, we're, we're looking at very long-ish wavelengths of light, so about a millimeter. So for if, if something is glowing at a temperature our eyes to see, can see, it's a, it's a, a couple of thousand degrees at least uh, around there. So the sun, 5,000 degrees is very white hot down to you can make a piece of iron glow red hot at, at lower probably a thousand degrees ish you know plus or minus a couple of hundred as you go down to, to to longer wavelengths than our eyes can see you're seeing colder and colder temperatures and so if this cosmic microwave background all has the same temperature then you go down and measure the way at, at wavelengths of about a millimeter and then you see whether all of those instruments agree on the thing that they're seeing and on the temperature that they see and on the spectrum that they get. And as is in the book, and I'll put it up on screen, uh, these 147 different measurements all line up absolutely remarkably well for a black body spectrum, this, this one special, everything's at the same temperature spectrum at 2.725 Kelvin, so 2.725 degrees above absolute zero. And that is absolutely not what anyone has ever seen when they've pointed a detector at the ocean. So what, what do people see when they point a detector at the ocean? Well, it's at about 270 degrees to 300 degrees. So 270 is the freezing point of, that's zero degrees Celsius. Uh, 273 and so most of the oceans are at about 20 or 30 degrees or something like that so you know around about 300 kelvin uh and so you would see uh light uh, uh, uh emitted at at, lo at shorter wavelengths in, in sort of the infrared range not way down here at millimeter ranges and you would also see evidence that it's it's water you would get specific you know, if you looked very, very hard at it, you, you might see specific molecular lines or whatever from water. We know what water looks like when you look at it with a detector, because it's water. It's the, probably the first thing that everyone points the detector at. Uh, and it, it has never looked like this. So, so where, so there's, there's still, still questions, right? So <laughs> firstly, why, why does Robitaille object to firstly the the data uh, and secondly the interpretation that astronomers have for what we what they see with um, cosmic microwave background telescopes? Well, it's this. It's at this point. It's it's quite tempting to do some sort of amateur psychoanalysis of of why why he would have a problem with this uh, and why. When he's not done any experiments to show it wrong, he still believes that he's right. And why a whole bunch of people are cheering him on on his YouTube channel. I suspect there's an interesting story you can tell about people just like to stick it to authority. It's, it seemed that any sort of authority, stick it to the government, stick it to the medical people. Now now we can stick it to cosmologists because they've had it too easy for too long in, in their sort of authority. And so any old theory will do as long as someone who sounds sounds like they know what they're talking about, says it with enough confidence to a whole bunch of people who don't know what they're talking about either. Okay, so, so we, we also know that he, as you said, he's not alone in, in this um, objection or uh, resistance to modern cosmology. Now, the whole point of the book, though, that I think the thing that we tried to get across is that cosmologists uh, are not closed-minded people and they do welcome 
new ideas, but they have to be new ideas that fit with the observations. We can't, if somebody comes along with an idea that doesn't fit with the observations in hand, then there is no point in taking that further and, and unless there's some weird get out clause about what needs to be done to get the observations to match. So again, I think some of this, we've seen this, right? We, we've met people who have their alternative mm. views of cosmology and they can get quite cross and claim that the, the establishment, mm. whoever they are, I, I, don't, I haven't got my card yet, um, won't listen to them, but yet they have ideas which would completely revolutionize the cosmos. And I guess for an outsider, they might sort of see that person as a bit more of a Robin Hood character rather than, yeah. I don't want to say crank because we don't <laughs> want to label people because I said we like people coming up with new ideas, but somebody who is not, not doing science in the sense of they're not showing how their ideas match with observations. Yeah, so we don't want to say that science doesn't have, you know, it's, it's, it's still a human activity. There's still human beings doing it and we're not perfect. But the the reason there are reasons why we do it the way that we do it. There are reasons why you publish in well respected journals, why you write up your results, why you try and put them in a form where other other scientists can understand them at least. Uh, a, a good illustration of this, which I like from the book, we we've um, we've talked before about Big Bang nucleosynthesis here, about at the very early stages of the Big Bang things are hot enough that nuclear reactions happen. One of the first uh, groups that tried to do the exact calculations to work that out was a student of Fred Hoyle, uh, Robert Wagoner. But Hoyle was an opponent of the Big Bang. But because the Big Bang is a proper scientific theory, even an opponent could use it, use the mathematics and produce predictions out of it. With, with theories like this, there's just nothing I can get a handle on as a, as a scientist, as a cosmologist, especially as a theoretician. There's just nothing here. There's no framework for me to go, OK, if this if, if this was right, what would I expect to see? Uh, there's just there's just none of that. There's just some wild theory thrown off. And as you were saying before, um, the reason why we sort of reject that idea out of hand is because oh, there, there's all those dozens of different instruments. So if Robert Tarley is correct, it's it's dozens and dozens of expert engineers and scientists who have tried to measure something from the sky and accidentally measured the ocean regardless of how they've built their instrument and regardless of the fact that some of them you know um at, some, at one point in the 70s someone managed to convince someone with a private jet to be able to stick an instrument out of the top hatch of a Learjet to point out at the cosmic microwave background. And we've put satellites in space. I mean, the, the, the COBE satellite was 900 kilometers above the Earth. And more modern satellites are even further away than that. So, you know, you better have a good answer to these sorts of objections, but, you know, there's nothing, you know, and in particular, you better be able to put that in the form of a paper that you could submit somewhere and we could look at it and all try to understand what you're talking about. And it's a sign of that, you know, almost, yeah, you could call it pseudoscience that that isn't, hasn't been forthcoming. Let, let me just finish with a very small anecdote. A, a couple of years ago, I was traveling and I won't say where, where I was traveling to, but I, you were allowed to travel back then. Right. And I actually went to a lab where they develop a lot of these instruments for detection of cosmic microwave background and doing submillimeter observations, et cetera. And uh, I walked around and you know these labs are incredible places, right? You have these ultra cold sources and you have all these various beams and detectors, et cetera. Highly technical. People there are leaders in the field. They understand the instruments. They understand the physics. And you know, they've got to grips with all of this. And it's really high tech. And I did ask the, the head of the lab. I said, oh, did you know about this person who claims that all you're seeing is a reflection of the ocean? And they just roll their eyes. <laughs> and I think that sort of summarizes it. Yeah. Where you have, oh, you guys don't know what you're doing, as opposed to, you know, the, 
the, the real people that really understand what's going on. Yeah.